Indeed he is, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and worthy of the praise that you've offered up this morning. Grateful for your presence. If you are a visitor, we're so grateful for your presence here today. Uh, well, I'm, I'm grateful for those of you that are not visitors as well. But, but in any case, for you visitors, we're grateful that you're here. Hope you'll come back at your every opportunity. A couple things I want to make you aware of. In the, in the pew in front of you, there is a Bible, a little brown Bible. Uh, and it's uh, there for the purpose of if you would like to have a Bible, if you have a need for it, have somebody you'd like to give a Bible to, you feel free to take that Bible from the pew that's in front of you. It is a gift from us to you. And secondly, we'd like for you to know that we have a jam program every Sunday morning. Jesus and Me is what that stands for, and it's a class during the sermon period for our children, ages 3 to the 3rd grade. And that's the signal for them to make their way here to the front. Eddie will be leading us in a song, and then they will be dismissed to a class where some teachers will be teaching them a Bible lesson and giving them encouragement during the sermon time. So great to see you children here this morning. Good job, Eddie. That was the that was the plumber version. I know, I'm just teasing. At the outset of the lesson, I want to make mention of something today that uh, Penny and I were talking about before worship, literally right before worship. Uh, and that was the subject of uh, this being her uh, Sunday to uh, be here with me, and, and of course she was here last Sunday, but, but in any case, uh, and the thought occurred, maybe, is the preacher's wife supposed to place membership? That was the question of the moment. Uh, but in any case, uh, we would like officially for the elders and the congregation to know that Penny officially places membership among us this morning, and, uh, and so I am so grateful to have her at my side, and and, uh, and the, the, the welcoming that you're doing and have been doing is a marvelous thing. This is an exciting time, exciting time for Penny and myself, uh, for the congregation, the church, but the whole community has been showing great kindness and grace toward us as we begin a new ministry together, serving the Lord here. I've been here for now over 11 years. Having said that, though, this is going to be somewhat of a new ministry, if you will, certainly a refreshing of ministry, and, and we look forward to the opportunities. Uh, we're excited about the visions that she and I have about new adventures and impacts that uh, not only in our married life, but also in things that we might do in the church here. We're looking forward to sharing with the elders and with the congregations the things that, that we would love to be a part of and to launch um, in the church here. Penny is bringing new talents and new gifts uh, to our congregation, not only in, our, in my marriage with her, but also in my work with the church here. So the question of the hour is, what does the Lord need? What does the Lord want and need to be done by us and by the church? What new things might God bring into the pathway of the future of this church and the destiny of this congregation? And we look forward to the possibilities of that. The thing I want you to know, the thing that you and I must know, is that the Lord has need of you, my friend. He has need of me and of Penny. He has need of you. And that is the message of the hour today. The Lord has need of you. The Master's need for His servants has been manifested throughout all the Bible in which He called men and women, not just for the sake of calling them, but calling them to a need, to a ministry, 
to a purpose, to a destiny, if you will. Great men called to God to be used by God for some service. Indeed, that's true of all of His creation. Throughout history, we see, in, for example, in Isaiah chapter 6 and verses 1 through 8, that God was seeking for a man that might stand in the place to speak in his behalf to the people of God and to call them to faithfulness. And Isaiah said in the long ago, Here am I, send me. God called him with an intent to fulfill a need. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4, God calls Jeremiah to the ministry of God. And it says that before I formed you in the womb, I had known you and appointed you to be a prophet among my people. There was, in fact, a need that was needed, and God used Jeremiah to fill that need. Moses in the long ago, in Exodus 4 and verse 10, the Bible says God chose Moses, not for a small task, but literally to lead God's people out of bondage and oppression and into the promised land. God had a need, and He called a servant called Moses to fulfill that need. And one of the more beautiful spots is where the Apostle Paul reflects back on why he was an apostle and how he came to be the man of God he was. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15, Paul says that God set me apart before I was born. Before I was born, He set me apart so that I might preach the gospel among the Gentiles. <coughs> God even called a donkey. God even called a donkey because he had need of him. There was a ministry that that donkey was going to perform and God called him to that service. As Jesus waited outside the city of Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 21, verse 1, he was about to make his triumphant entry into the city. You might think he might ride on an ivory and gold chariot drawn by a dozen white stallions with pomp and circumstance and trumpets blowing and dancers dancing. That is not what happened. Rather, it says that Jesus called for a donkey because he had a need. And that was going to be the creature that would supply that need. He sent the disciples into the city of Jerusalem in Matthew 21. And there they were to retrieve a donkey, if you will. He told them, if anyone says to you, you shall say, uh, to, uh, says anything to you about taking the donkey that they were going to find, he says, you shall say to them, the Lord has need of him. And they will give the donkey to you. They literally went into the city, found a donkey hitched to a post, as Jesus said they would, unhitched it from the post, and as they began to leave, someone said, what are you doing? And these immortal words were said. Master has need of him. The master has need of him. What a wonderful set of words. The master has need of him. Christ's triumphant entry into the holy city was aided by a humble donkey willing to surrender his back, if you will, to the service of God's needs. I'm telling you that everything and everyone in God's creation serves the needs of the master. And that's the thing you and I should see about ourselves today that you and I can bring certain things to God that, that maybe no one else can. And that moment, it was a donkey that God needed. It was that creature that was among all creatures was the one that could supply what the master needed that day. And so the word of the hour was, the master has need of him. Jesus had need of him to serve in a mighty and triumphant moment in that the world was going to be changed forever in part by the service that a humble donkey was going to provide. A donkey was predicted of God and chosen in ancient prophecy and in the mind of God as the very one who was to carry our Lord to his destiny. It wasn't just any donkey. It was the donkey that Jesus chose that he told the disciples where to look, where to find him, and what to do when they got him and bring that donkey to me because he's going to provide this service for me. I'm telling you, my friend, if God can have such determination about the service and the need for donkey, you and I have great need before God. He can use you. He can use me if we'll surrender ourselves to Him as that donkey did that day. The first thing I want you to consider about this donkey that the master had need of him was that the donkey himself was oblivious to God's plan. At the moment that that donkey was found, he was hitched to a post, perhaps even had his face down into an oat bucket, 
eating away, minding his own business, thinking his world was a bowl of cherries. That was life for him, hitched to a post. He was oblivious to the master's plan and the destiny that God had for him. In verse 3, the text, in verse 3 of Matthew 21, the text says, the master has need of him. The master said to the disciples, you go find that donkey and you uh, untie the donkey and bring the donkey to me. What that donkey knew was the street was at his feet, the post was at his face, and that was the life that he knew. Do you maybe see yourself in this? That sometimes we don't know what it is God wants us to do. That we don't see the great plan, the destiny that God may have for you and for me. I made mention of the dreams and the plans that Penny and I have that the elders have for the future of the church here. But do you know for yourself what plans God has for you? And I'm going to remind you, my friend, if he can make great and dynamic and triumphant use of a donkey, he has a need for you as well and for me. The kind of thing that you and I need to do is to find out what our life is supposed to be. So many are living their daily lives clueless to the possibilities or for that matter, the purpose that God has for us. My friend, I'm going to say it now and again and again. The Lord has need of you. There's more to life than just what we're seeing around us. There's more to existence than the purpose of standing at a hitch. God's purpose. God's purpose for you. There are ministries of promise and matters of prophecy. That's what it's said about this uh, donkey. In verses 4 and 5, the text goes on to say in Matthew 21... This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you. But watch this. Coming to you, humble, and mounted on the back of a donkey. It was a matter of prophecy. This donkey did not just simply step into some activity. He wasn't just invited to something haphazardly. Rather, it was a matter of prophecy that this donkey was going to do the deed that it did. He's referring to Zechariah 9 and verse 9, where Zechariah wrote in the long ago, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation in his hand, he is humble, and he is mounted on the back of a donkey. Literally, a thousand years or 700 years prior to this moment in Matthew 21, there was a prophet inspired of God to predict what that, that donkey was going to be doing that day. I'm telling you, if God makes such meticulous plans for the destiny and the service of a donkey, what can He do for you and for me in service to Him? My question to you is, is are you searching? Are you seeking to discover what is your destiny? Or rather, is your head in a bucket of oats while you're tied to a hitch? Isn't that way daily life is? You've got your daily routine of things you've got to do. Imagine the daily routine of this donkey. His best day was a day in which he could carry supplies back to the farm, I suppose. So here he is in the city awaiting for that next thing he was going to do of his daily routine. But I'm telling you, on that day, his daily routine was totally flipped upside down. He was no longer going to be carrying supplies from the general store back to the farm. He was going to be carrying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in a triumphant entry to the moment of Jesus' coronation, as it were. And that was going to change not only the destiny of the world, but also the purpose and life of that monkey. How about or that donkey? How about yourself? There yeah, were monkeys too, I guess. But anyways, if God can use donkeys, He can use monkeys, He can use me. But anyways, that's the message. But are you searching for what it is God's intent is for you? It'd be nice if we could have somebody come and tell us. The master has sent me to you to tell you, here's something he wants you to do. He does that, my friend. He sends people into your life and mine on a regular basis to encourage us to ministries in the church. How many times have you heard from this pew, from the elders, and from others, here is a ministry that needs to be done? We sat in class this morning, and as we were listening uh, to Steve Ridenauer speaking about a need for teachers in the JAM program, a ministry that's incredibly important to the children of this church and the future of this church, to the JAM program. And, and the invitation was, here's a service you can provide. And here is the catchphrase. My friends, the Master has need for you to do that. 
So are you searching? Are you looking for that moment in which you, like that donkey, can find your place in the Lord? That you and I are growing in the Lordship of Jesus on a daily basis and seeking out what He wants for us. The fellowship of love with those that God loves. That you and I can take part in that and finding ways in which we can serve Christ in those ways. In evangelism. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, you don't need me to tell you the Master has need for you to do evangelism. He says it himself. Matthew 28, 18 says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And then he says this, go therefore and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says this, and then you teach them to observe all the things I've commanded you. And with that, he not only commissioned those 12 to evangelize the world, he not only commissioned those 12 to go and teach all nations, he also said, once you've brought them to me and once they've been baptized into Christ, you teach them to do exactly what I just told you to do. There you go, my friend. You don't need an invitation from me. You don't need disciples to come into the city to unhitch you from the post. Jesus said it right there in that text. That His intent is for you to help in evangelizing, evangelizing the world. There is a destiny for you and for me. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. But then also, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul writes that the Master saved us and called us to a holy calling. And here is that holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace which He gave us in Christ. He says, I didn't call that donkey because it was such a great donkey. Was it the most handsome donkey in the city? Was it the most brilliant? Was it the biggest and strongest? That's not the case. He called the donkey because he had a purpose for that donkey. And so the text says, The Master saved us and called us into a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. I want you to hear Him saying, He had a purpose for you. He called you into the kingdom for a service that you would provide. Maybe a humble service. Maybe something as simple as being a carriage to carry something for the Lord. He goes on to say in that text, And He brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. So Paul points to himself and says, Look, I was given a job, but it wasn't just me. He called you also to the intent of a purpose to fulfill in Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, that you and I are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, now here it is, which God prepared for us to do in Christ. You and I have been brought into Christ, that we should do certain works, that there is a ministry, a, a plan, a destiny for us to fulfill even as He did, even, even as He did that donkey. He was oblivious to it until he was brought to the Lord. Number two, God sent people to lead him to his destiny. The master had need of him and sent messengers to get him. In verses 1 and 2 of that text of Matthew 21, the text says that Jesus sent the two disciples into the city and he told them, you go into the city and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her and untie them and bring them to me. That was the plan. I suppose if he wanted to, he could have called the donkey himself. If he wanted to, he could just miraculously empower the donkey to know where to go. But that's not the way he did it. He sent some disciples to go retrieve the donkey and to take the donkey to his new purpose. God sent people to lead him to his destiny. Let me encourage you in this. Surround yourself with the people of God, with the elders and other leaders of the church. There are people performing ministries here, whether it's the jam program or Bible school program or whatever. Surround yourself with those people and see what they can lead you to, that they might very well draw you into. Allow yourself to be guided into some ministry, some service to Christ here. Don't sit and do nothing. Find your place in the kingdom of God because I assure you, God has need of you. The Master has need of you. And He has a plan for you. And so surround yourself with people who will lead you into that. He's done that.
throughout all of history, leading those who were, were willing to their destiny. And it didn't just happen by coincidence. Those people were sent. I'm telling you that there were a series of events that led to me coming to this congregation some 11 years ago. There were people involved. I was assisted and drawn here by people who sought to bring me here to this ministry. And that being the case, that's also true of you in your ministry for Christ. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 13, it says concerning Peter with Cornelius that God had told Cornelius, you go and send to Joppa and you fetch a guy by the name of Simon, Simon Peter. And you have him brought to you because he's going to tell you what things God has. Send a job of the text says. And bring Simon who is called Peter. And he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, both you and all of your household. He was led to that destiny. And I want you to see that for yourself. That there are others who might draw you into that destiny. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 26 God uh, spoke, the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and told him, I want you to rise and I want you to go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And he rose and he went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch of, 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 of the court official of Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians. That wasn't an accident. That wasn't a coincidence. I'm telling you, the meeting of Philip with that Ethiopian eunuch was not just simply a coincidence. It was God putting men together and they were going to draw one another into being and doing the things that he wanted for them. It didn't just happen. The disciples' job is to bring others to Jesus and to that ministry, whatever that ministry is. In John chapter 1 and verse 40, Jesus is at the beginning of his ministry. Uh, John the Baptist has pointed in chapter 1 of John to Jesus as he walked by. John was standing with some disciples and he pointed to Jesus there in the distance as Jesus walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And with that, Andrew was drawn over to Jesus. And as he talked with Jesus and realized that this was indeed the Messiah, in verse 40 of that text, it says that Andrew, uh, Simon Peter's brother, first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. And the text says, And he brought him to Jesus. I'm telling you that God brings people into your life. People who will draw you into ministry. Allow that to happen. Surround yourself with people who are servants of God and let them draw you into being a useful servant to God. It was the case for that donkey that day that there were those that God brought to him, unloosed him from the hitch and brought him to Jesus and to the service that he was going to provide. Are we bringing people? Like Andrew in the long ago, when he realized that Jesus was the Messiah, the first thing he thought of was, my brother Peter, he needs to know about this. Now look how famous Peter became. Of the two men, Andrew and Peter, Peter was the one that wound up coming to the surface as the dominant of the two of them and the one who did so many great things for God. And throughout the scriptures, there's so much more said about the work that Peter did. But how did that come to be? What was the starting moment? of Peter becoming the great man of God that he was destined to become. It started with his humble brother, Andrew, whose greatest task on that day was he saw the need to bring his brother to Jesus. And he did so. He brought Peter to Jesus so that Peter could see what he had found. Are we bringing people to Jesus? Are we surrounding those that could be brought into ministry and bringing them? Come to Jesus and fulfill God's good intent for you. It's a beautiful word. In Matthew 21, when Jesus sent the disciples to get that donkey, He gave them the reason. He didn't just send them. He sent them with a purpose. The Master has need of Him. Go and bring that donkey to Me. Christ's triumphant entry into the holy city was aided by a humble donkey who would serve His needs. And I'm telling you, everything and everyone in God's creation serves God's needs. So don't ever forget this, my friend. The Master has need of you. Thirdly and finally, the Bible says that that donkey had to be loosed in order to be brought and used by the Master. In verse 2 of Matthew 21, it says, You go into the city, you will find that donkey tied there to a post, and you with a colt with her, you loose that donkey, unbind it, and bring them to me. While tied to the post, 
a donkey was useless. It was not going to accomplish, it wasn't even accomplishing what the master, uh, his own owner wanted because he was just tied to a post. And there he stood doing nothing. While tied to the post, he was useless. But once he was loosed and brought to Jesus, once the Lord, our Lord, was able to uh, have the donkey present, it became a historic moment. One of the most historic moments in all the Bible. One of the most powerful, triumphant moments. So much so that what do they call Jesus' entrance? He arrived in town. I mean, he arrived in town. But what is, it, what is that event, that moment called? The triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Like a general, like a commander coming in. And that triumphant moment was on the back of a donkey. But it was because the donkey had been loosed. That was the first thing that had to happen. Loose the donkey and bring the donkey back to me. My question to you right now is, have you been loosed? Have you been loosed from the things that bind you? Have you been loosed from the things that keep you from being the servant of God you could be? In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, John writes that Jesus Christ is the ruler of the kings of the earth and He loved us and He loosed us from our sins by His blood. Are you still bound to that post of sin? Are you still bound from being able to do the things that God would have you to do? Do you feel your hands and feet tied that you cannot do the things for God that you would want to do? Well, that may start with the idea of being loosed from your sins. If you have sin in your life, my friend, it will not make you, it will keep you from being able to serve the Lord. You need to be loosed from those sins. And it's by His blood that that occurs. And you are washed in that blood as it says concerning Saul of Tarsus in Acts twenty two sixteen, when he arose and was baptized to wash away his sins. And in so doing, he was loosed from those sins. And if you've not done that, I plead with you to make that response this morning. What ties us down from serving the Master? What holds us back? What hinders you from being useful? Is it sin? Is it a stubborn heart that has you right now tied to a post? Is it fear? Is it guilt that keeps you or me from serving Christ as we could? All of those things might very well be intimidating and keep us, but Jesus is here to loose you. There are people that would be here to loose you. In Matthew chapter 21, indeed, that's why the disciples were sent, to loose the donkey for his destiny. I ask you to do that this morning, to be willing to be loosed from whatever it is that holds you back from being the servant of God you could be. Let go of that and lay hold of the ministry and the destiny God has for you. Jesus could have walked into Jerusalem. He could have had horses and a chariot if He chose to. He could have used His own feet and His own sandals to wander through the gate of that great city, but He didn't. He chose to ride on the back of a donkey. So having come to Jesus, Jesus made that donkey His throne that day as he made that triumphant entry into the city, a symbol of his own royalty. The master has need of you. The master has need of you for ministries and for great things that he will do for you. He has a destiny for you. And my friend, if he can make a destiny for a, a, a donkey, he can do great things with you and with me if we'll surrender our lives to him. Never forget this. The Lord has need of you. Find your place in that. And if you've not yet become a child of God, will you consider doing that today? There are many who have been coming here and are, are new to us. And you've never made it known that you want to be a part of the family of God. Let me encourage you right now to make this your day. To be unhitched, as it were, from whatever holds you back. To come forward this morning and let it be known. I want to be a part of the ministries of the church here. As I said concerning Penny just a little while ago. She wants to be a member here. Wants to be a part of the service of God here. Wants to find her part and place here. Is that you also? Have you been coming here for so many weeks, maybe months, and yet have yet to say, I want to be a servant in this family? Will you not do that now? You can come forward and make that known today as we stand and sing. Oh, Jesus, I
I got to tell you, I can't sing that song without thinking about something that's very special and precious uh, to Penny and I. I'll share it with you. I, we captured that song and the sentiment of it about surrendering ourselves. Uh, and we saw that message not only in regard to our surrender to Jesus, but also our surrender to each other. I so captured by it that I actually had a plaque that has that song literally carved into it. That very, the words of that song are carved into that plaque. And I gave it to Penny as a gift. And with that, the promise that to her, I surrender all. And, and she has made the same sentiments to me and in very real ways. And you just need to know this. I've, Penny has surrendered a lot in coming to me. She's literally done what oftentimes is said in a wedding. You know, she's surrendered. Uh, she has left uh, her family and her home, surrendering her name and all that she has. That's oftentimes said in a wedding ceremony. Penny has literally done that sacrificing, surrendering the home that she had, that she had made and built in Tennessee, and the family that was surrounding her there, and, and left all of that to, to come and be with me. And I want you to capture this thought and to be with you. She didn't just surrender to come be my wife. She came, she surrendered to come here to be your servant as well. And, uh, and so I, that song has real special meaning to her and I. And so every time you hear that song led, you just know where my head is at. I'm thinking about her and I and, and her surrender and the things that she surrendered. So anyways, enough talking about Penny. I, I try not to talk about her so much. It's just, but you all have a beautiful day and find your place in the kingdom of God. And it does start with that song. If you're going to find your place in serving God, it starts with surrendering to him that he might use you. Let us pray. Lord, as we close our services today, we ask your blessings on those that we have been mentioned that are ill. We rejoice in those that you have blessed and have a recovery for. You comfort those that are in need. Lord, we thank you for each blessing that you give us each and every day, those that we seek from you and those that you know that we need. Thank you. Lord, as we go through this week and, and onward in our lives, we ask that you walk with us, keep us in your hand. Lord, keep the evil one away because we know he is there seeking to move us and others away from you. Forgive us our sins and shortcomings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.